My name's Brandon and this is Nickelodeon Video Game History, a show where I take a look back on all of the video games based on Nickelodeon shows and retrospectively review them. It's finally happened. We've made it to the very first SpongeBob video game. Everyone's favourite Yellow Sea Critter technically made his video game debut in the plethora of Nicktoons racing releases, but Legend of the Lost Bachelor was his first chance to strike out on his own. Released on March 15, 2001 exclusively for the Game Boy Color, it was around about this time that Spongebob was really taking off. I'm not going to go into too much detail surrounding the history of Spongebob considering, you know, it's one of the most popular and successful shows of all time. The idea was pitched to Nickelodeon in 1997 and was eventually picked up by the network, making its debut in a special airing following the 1999 Kids Choice Awards. It would make its proper debut a couple of months later on July 17, becoming Nickelodeon's greatest achievement until this day. SpongeBob's popularity has held strong for over 20 years, with two brand new spin-offs incoming, three theatrical films released, and no signs of slowing down. Naturally, a show of this magnitude released throughout the early 2000s would receive a boatload of games, over 20 different releases equating to about one per year. Impressively, while a lot of people have been dreading the so-called SpongeBob avalanche of games, Nickelodeon generally spaced these out. It's incredibly rare to see Spongebob games released back to back the way Cartoon Network did with Ben 10 or Adventure Time. Spongebob's video game history kicked off with The Legend of the Lost Spatula, which was developed by Vicarious Visions. We've already seen them develop the terrible Wild Thornberry's Rambler, and they'd go on to develop the handheld version of Revenge of the Flying Dutchman and Battle for Bikini Bottom, as well as Codename Kids Next Door Operation Soda. Critically, reviewers thought of Spongebob's debut as quite average. It landed at a 6.1 average review score, which isn't too terrible, and it puts it around the middle of the pack when compared to other Nick games. So for the very first time on Nickelodeon video game history, I have to ask, are you ready kids? The rich narrative in Legend of the Lost Spatula sees Spongebob stumbling upon a mysterious statue. Mr. Krabs explains the legend behind it, setting our hero on a quest to find four other knobs hidden around Bikini Bottom to access the statue and try and retrieve the legendary golden spatula from the Flying Dutchman. To achieve this, you're going to be doing a lot of jumping and a lot of attacking. Starting off, you're basically thrown into a hub world, scrolling along familiar locations like Spongebob Street, the Krusty Krab, and Sandy's Tree Dome. This hub world then branches off into the worlds you need to explore to gain the other knobs, with these locations again being iconic settings from the show, such as jellyfish fields. Gameplay is kept pretty simple. A button uses Spongebob's currently equipped weapon, while B jumps. That's it. If you manage to screw this up and Spongebob takes damage, your health status will be indicated by how Spongebob's dressed. At maximum health, he'll be dressed in his hall monitor uniform, but taking damage will strip him to his usual clothes, his underwear, and if you take more damage, Spongebob will flop out his gigantic hog. On the surface, Legend of the Lost Bachelor just seems like a 2D side-scroller, but after playing it, I'd liken it more to a Metroidvania game. While the main goal of each level is to get the other knobs, while doing so you'll discover new weapons for Spongebob to take advantage of. These weapons will allow you to make short work of specific enemy types or even access new areas. It's undoubtedly in that Metroid or Castlevania style. Starting out, Spongebob's only attack is to blow bubbles. It's a bit of a weird attack too, because it'll go out horizontal for a little bit, but then float upwards, making it tricky to use effectively in most situations. The start of the game is really rough because of this. It felt like defeating or even just avoiding enemies was unnecessarily hard and was quickly souring me on the experience. It initially feels like you can't avoid taking damage 99% of the time in the early going. Eventually, I came across a treasure chest that said I had found a new item. These treasure chests give you increased health the vast majority of the time, but every now and then you'll discover a weapon or some ammo. Annoyingly, the game doesn't tell you how to use these weapons. It's left up to you to discover that you have to press select, which brings up your objectives as well as an inventory where you can equip things. Discovering this instantly made the game way more enjoyable. Actually having a way to dispatch basically every enemy in your way was a godsend. Like I said, various weapons will work on specific enemies. It's basically just trial and error to discover what works, and some of the weapons I didn't even use outside of their required appearance in specific boss battles. 
To be honest, you can probably play through the entire game, save for the boss battles, without engaging with these different items. In the few boss battles that are here, the key to actually hurting them is using the one weapon they're vulnerable to, which almost always felt random. There didn't seem to be any real reason why all of my weapons couldn't deal out damage. Perhaps a better version of these boss battles would have taken inspiration from Mega Man. Mega Man bosses always have specific weapons they're weakest to, but that doesn't mean you can't utilize the other weapons to great effect. Doing that here would have made a lot more sense. While we're on this subject, we've got to talk about how underwhelming the final boss battle is. So Spongebob gets the knobs, unlocking a pathway literally to hell. Guess that's what he gets for trying to flash people all the time. You eventually platform your way to the Flying Dutchman, who you force feed Krabby Patties to for a little bit, and then the boss fight sort of just ends. It finishes with such little fanfare that I initially assumed this was part one of the boss battle, and the Flying Dutchman would return later in the level for the genuine final showdown. But nope. That was it. That was the end of the game. The idea of a Spongebob Metroidvania is so damn cool, especially after the mountain of minigame collections we've sat through recently. The biggest thing holding back Legend of the Lost Spatula from reaching truly enjoyable status is the control scheme. Having to pause the game, flip through a menu, find and select the item you want, then backtrack all the way out of the menu is insanely cumbersome. I get that you're sort of limited with your controls on the Game Boy Color, but damn, they needed to find a better way to do it. Or alternatively, change the placement of enemies and the layout of levels. Changing items this way is always going to be clunky no matter what, but if you weren't forcing me to pause the game every 5 seconds, it wouldn't be as bad. When you're encountering two different enemy types right after each other, requiring you to use two completely different weapons to take them out, it's just a pain. It takes what could almost be a serviceable game and turns it into a chore. The other thing really holding back Legend of the Lost Spatula is the platforming. SpongeBob's got the world's highest vertical leap here, which is nice, except for when you want to move sideways. It's so clunky and stilted, and it results in there being no real precision when needing to move from platform to platform. You spend the entire game trying to adjust to this weird feeling, but even by the finale, I wasn't feeling like I'd mastered it. Every jump I'd make came down to a 50-50 coin flip between me nailing it perfectly and me plummeting a million miles below, resulting in a death or worse, having to climb all the way up again. So yeah, the two major aspects of the game are both fundamentally flawed. Usually I'd absolutely trash a game for this kind of execution, but something about Legend of the Lost Spatula has me holding back from that. I think it's because, deep down, there's a fun and interesting game here. Literally just introducing some shoulder buttons that can scroll through your items would instantly fix the combat, and the jumping isn't so poor that it can't be saved. I'm hoping that their other two handheld Spongebob games follow this formula and iterate on it. A well-executed Spongebob Metroidvania is within Vicarious Vision's grasp. There are quite a few references to early Spongebob episodes here, which I was impressed by. The first season of the show had only just finished airing a couple weeks before this game's release, so it's nice to see stuff like the iconic locations used as levels, and characters like Bubble Bass and the Flying Dutchman being enemies. One thing I didn't understand was why when you talk to the Chum Bucket, you get a line of dialogue that says, I went to college. Is this a reference that's flying over my head? The final major thing to mention here is the frame rate. Now, I don't know whether this is an emulation thing or something wrong with the actual game itself, but good lord the frame rate chugs at times here. I can't say I've ever seen other games on Visual Boy Advance chug this badly, and even when I'm emulating PS3 games, they tend to run smoother and more consistently. Because of this uncertainty, I'm not really using this in my assessment of the game, but it's something to be mindful of if you're attempting to play this game yourself. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot more to say about Legend of the Lost Spatula. 
It's a very interesting idea, making a SpongeBob Metroidvania light, but the game is so short that there's not a whole lot of evolution of the ideas that are present. This means there's not a whole lot to talk about. I beat the game in around 90 minutes, but if you're better at the game than me, it's possible to clear it in half an hour. We've seen a number of games like this, namely the Ren and Stimpy platformers, where pros who know what they're doing can clear the game quickly, but first timers will struggle because of the intense difficulty. Legend of the Lost Spatula really isn't like that. It's not too hard and they're super friendly with their checkpointing and the fact that you don't suffer any major consequences for dying. As a result, a blind playthrough is still going to be short. Overall, I wish I liked Legend of the Lost Spatula more than I do. As I've mentioned seemingly a million times in this review, the concept is gold. If they just tweaked the platforming and figured out how to handle the multiple items better, this would be in the top tier of Nickelodeon games I've played so far. Instead, it finds itself tumbling down the list because its core gameplay mechanics are severely flawed. It ends up being a disappointment, but good lord, I would rather see a risky and hard to pull off idea like this instead of another Nick game where I play mini golf or have to sit through a shooting gallery. Next time, we'll have another TV show debuting on Nickelodeon video game history. Unlike SpongeBob, Rocket Power hasn't been featured in any of the games we've covered so far, meaning Get an Air is the first time we'll get to see it in video game form. Personally, I've always thought Rocket Power is a show that gets way too much crap. It's a product of its time, and it really struck while extreme sports were at their peak. The premise of the show seems ripe for video games, so let's hope that Rocket Power Get an Air will be able to cook up a game just as interesting as Legend of the Lost Spatula. To make sure you don't miss out on that video or more of the super secret special projects I have coming in the next month, make sure you're subscribed.